Hello, and welcome to Rise of the Data Cloud. Today's episode features an interview with Moin Haik and Vlad Barkov from Warner Music Group. Moin is the Senior Vice President and Vlad is the Vice President of Data Architecture and Engineering. On this episode, Moin and Vlad discuss the transformation of the music industry during the pandemic, choosing the right business partners, making data independent, and much more. So please enjoy this interview between Moin Haik, Vlad Barkov, and your host, Steve Ham. Hey, it's it's great to uh, see you guys today. It's great to have you on. We, this is the first time we've had two people on our podcast, so I'm expecting it to be twice as good as usual. So today, uh, Moin, it, it's good to have you. Thank you, Steve. A pleasure to be here. Really looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah, and Vlad, you as well. Same. Thank you for having me, and it really is great to be here. Now, Warner Music Group is one of the giants of the music industry, so most of our listeners are aware of it, but it would be helpful if you would talk a little bit more about Warner Music Group itself. What are the pieces of the business? How does it work? Sure. So Warner Music Group is basically a very iconic and what I'd say a, a dynamic collection of brands. You know, even I didn't realize that the legacy goes back nearly two centuries and the presence of the company today exists in nearly every genre of music and it also extends in nearly every region on the planet. But we're basically comprised of, of two primary businesses. The first is recorded music, which focuses on the production, promotion, and then the distribution of music from artists and creators. And the second part of the company is music publishing. And music publishing represents songwriters, composers, essentially helping them in the promotion and what we call the licensing of their works across the marketplace. Now, some of our core labels you may be familiar with, their their names such as Atlantic, Electra, Parlophone and, and, and Warner Records itself. But there's also several celebrated brands that, that exist alongside that, some of which, such as Reprise, Sire, and Rhino. These have been a part of my life soundtrack since I first mm-hmm. got a record player back in the 70s. But the music business as a whole, it's, it's rather complex. It's the kind of stuff that you think of PowerPoint nightmares are made of. But it's important to really use the appropriate lens through which to observe the music landscape and try to look at it as a whole. So if you think from an artist perspective, it's about creating and connecting. And then for many of us as consumers, it's about how do I discover this music? How do I experience this music? And everything in between really helps facilitate and sometimes impedes all the processes that are involved from writing and producing the music to distributing it in all of its now ever-changing forms. And distribution today is really the primary source that, that we're all most f- familiar with. You likely consume more music via streaming than you do downloading. Although I personally still like the lean back model and find the right vinyl LP in my collection. But primarily people are consuming through distribution and, and downloading is really starting to, to, to go away as a format. And then the other big component I'd say in the landscape is what we call licensing and sync services. That's a major component. And it's not what a lot of consumers think about, but imagine watching your favorite TV shows or films without the advent of music. You know, whether it's a memorable theme song, pretty much all the 80s sitcom songs are burned in my brain, or it's some kind of montage in a film. The licensing sync services, these are the services that help songwriters and artists monetize their work across and into so many of these different forms of media that I mentioned. And today we're seeing this distribution and licensing growth turn more and more into other forms. The two key ones we've been tracking are e-gaming, which is where gaming itself has soundtrack, has music, but we're seeing a stronger growth in that space. Fitness is another one. You know, think of if you've been at the gym and you've experienced it in a larger setting versus in a more personalized way through a Peloton, that's licensing and sync services that, that bring that music. And there's other passive and, and immersive media formats that are emerging over time. Even, I don't know if they do this anymore, but if you think back, there was a time when grocery stores played music. I don't know if they still do that anymore, but all of that sort of distribution is also something that's part of the landscape. And then the other key thing is the whole idea of, of live entertainment. That's something that has been there throughout my lifetime and sadly not so much lately, but concerts, festivals, and clubs, the mechanics of producing these live shows 
promoting them and supporting them, that's a, a material part of this ecosystem. You know, you've done a great job, Moin, of describing the music industry. Very complicated, lots of factors, lots of facets. It's in the midst of this massive shift. In fact, it's in the midst of several shifts at the same time, which you've described. And also at the same time, we've got the COVID crisis, which has stopped performances. And hopefully about now they're going to start up again. But so how is Warner Music dealing with all these pressures? And what's its strategy for going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. It really has been in somewhat of an extraordinary and for many of us an unprecedented year in so many dimensions. And we're, we've all been challenged and professional and more importantly, in personal ways that, that have impacted our day to day. What we're seeing is that throughout all this, music is continuing to be a core part of everyone's lives. The numbers are showing that music consumption is actually up. And people are finding a way to transcend a lot of these impediments and make the right adjustments that the, pan, the pandemic has warranted. However, engagement is where we're seeing a lot of the adaptation or engagements where, where we're seeing a lot of the adoption. How we create, how we connect, how we experience has all transformed this past year. As I mentioned before, the music ecosystem is pretty diverse in how it distributes and, and disrupts as a whole. But the reality that has surfaced is through all of this, we're all in the same storm, but we're not in the same boat. And we've had to adapt to things such as a lack of live performances, even though behaviors are shifting, we have to find new opportunities for artists to be able to engage with consumers. As I mentioned earlier, e-gaming and fitness, they continue to be a growing channel for music. And recently we've made announcements around investing in virtual and immersive experiences as, as a way to engage consumers. Again, the key theme you're gonna hear, it's bringing it back to engagement and experience, not so much the how and where. When you were talking about virtual, you're talking about like, performances that are on, you know, like Zoom or something like that? Yeah, and not so much Zoom, but but similar experiences that are more immersive. We recently announced a partnership with a company called Wave that helps drive some of these virtual experiences, which are essentially concerts. You've probably heard other things over the past year, how concerts are being held in gaming platforms like Fortnite, and, and, and there's live streaming that's happening there. People are finding different ways to try to replicate that experience of it being collaborative, immersive. And, and somewhat live. And so in similar ways, everyone in the industry is making these adjustments from artists to the listeners themselves. Yeah. Now, in some ways, we're starting to get back to normal vis-a-vis -vis COVID. Do you, do you expect these other kind of alternative, you know, ways of experiencing things to continue and expand or will they fade as COVID fades? No, I think they'll they'll continue to expand. We're not we're not lo looking to use the term re returning back or going back to normal because I think it's a new normal that we're going to. It's it's going forward into a new normal, and that new normal will have some of the things that come back, such as live concerts. We're looking forward to those returning, but I think a lot of the newer forms of consumption are also going to remain and continue to grow because through the pandemic and through this past year, I'm sure we've all experienced the shift has made certain things work better than others. And you almost don't want to give up things that now do work better and go back to, to just the way things were before. So I think people who have discovered some of these new platforms are going to continue to want to experience those as well. Yeah. Now you've done a really, I think, a fantastic job of, of describing the dynamics of the business and Warner Music's role in it. Talk about technology and data now. How are you using data and technology to support the company's mission, strategies, and also deal with some of these stresses? Sure. So you, as we were talking earlier and seeing the shift that's happening in consumption and distribution, um, we're seeing the shift of when it came to music, things were when and where to this idea of things can be everywhere and every when. And streaming services, other forms of digital distribution, consumption, they've really allowed us to, to d disintermediate from traditional channels, as well as the ability to provide not just personalization, but what we call hyper-personalization and relevancy and ultimately context back to our consumers. And as I made the comment of us, all, all of us being in the same storm, data and technology are turning out to be crucial in, in helping us navigate these shifting and turbulent waters. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're striving for in the company is to really treat data as an enterprise currency. 
It's not something that's just a measure or a metric for a process, but really becomes a living currency in the company that can help drive opportunity and all forms of monetization, not just commerce, but the ability to take these signals and be better informed with them and understand how we're going to create new products and services, how we're gonna uncover new opportunities. Data historically has been vouchsafed in, in platforms and systems, and we're really trying to drive to a point where that becomes separated out and becomes its own sort of sig- set of signals that are available to drive the company forward. The term we use internally is this idea of a data fabric. And this fabric is something that weaves through our processes and our domains and flips the script of traditional approach. When we joined here over a year ago, we found this pattern where applications were were leading. You would hear people talk, they'd use the names of systems or the acronyms of systems. And you realize that business processes and domains were subordinated to applications. And we realize that's really not how we're going to be able to be nimble, be agile, and be responsive. We want to flip that script. And so this paradigm of a data fabric, and larger than that, the idea of a service fabric, the goal is to start to break these these sort of monoliths and, and boundaries apart and really let the business process and domain flourish as it should and be organic and be responsive to the, the market as naturally as it can. So when you talk about breaking the barriers, is that between the business units and between functions or is it literally all across those things, right? Ideally all across, right? Yeah. We, you don't want people to define themselves by I work on this application or I work mm-hmm. in this system, but really go back to understanding what is your role in the larger organization and ecosystem. And it's not about the software. It's not about the technology that, that you should be governed by. It's about the business process itself. Mm-hmm. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, I understand that Warner Music is building a new business, advertising. Really, that's really fascinating. So talk about that. Why is that coming along? And what are the new opportunities in data analytics that that creates? Sure. We are not really, people don't think of us as a direct-to-consumer brand because most of the music you're consuming, you're likely consuming from streaming services that that are out there. But we do have direct engagement because one of the core components in music is fan engagement. And to some extent that engagement can be merchandising, it can be monetized, but fans and and artists do look for that connection. And and we facilitate a lot of that through consumer experiences, whether it's websites, applications, things that are specific to genres or around specific events. And since there are monetization opportunities here, there potentially are are opportunities to engage advertisers and, and agencies in that connection as well. How do we identify the right audiences? How do we expose audiences to other opportunities and brands? And that's where ad tech can become a great facilitator and and, and really allow us to make, again, that experience personalized and relevant. That's really cool. So the two of you came over to Warner about a year ago. You, You were both at NBC Universal. It was almost like a package deal. So if you would, talk about, you know, why you came over from Warner and your roles here and the goals here. Sure. So let me just start at the very top of this with, as you progress through your career, you meet people that you connect with on a very deep level. And those relationships, they span the boundary of both professional and personal. And you develop this concept of a team that no longer is attached to an employer. And that's the case here. So Moyne and I met back at a previous employer and we just connected. When Moyne came over to to WMG, he had an opening, asked me if I would like to join him. And of course I jumped at the the chance. And this this is an important part of of our careers because he's coming in to a new organization and he has to establish trust and relationships. And when he brought me in, that's already there. Day one, I come in and I can sing his song and I have his back. And that's really important, especially now during the times that, that we're all living in, because both of us started fully remote. We've never been in the office from a work perspective. And 
and developing that trust and, and developing those relationships with people that you've never had the opportunity of really meeting face to face can be sometimes really difficult. And this is more than just, this goes down. So Moyne brought me in and then I have people that I've brought in as well. And one of these people in in particular is a gentleman named Mutu who has been with me. We've had the pleasure of working with each other across three employers and over the past, I think, 12 years. So some of these relationships go really deep and you find yourself in in this position where you have a team that just works and it works really well. You don't have to explain things. You don't have to spell everything out. Just like Moyne has has his data, his data leader in me, where I was effective as soon as I started within my data organization, I also have certain leaders that were effective as soon as I brought them in. Yeah, yeah it really is interesting to see, to think about how you, you guys came in the midst of this crisis, just about, and it was the fact that you came in as a team made it much easier for you guys to establish yourselves and, and get going quickly, I'm sure. That was really smart. Now, over the course of your careers, you both, you know, work for a lot of different places. You've been in a lot of different situations. And it seems like American business has been in the, the middle of one kind of transformation or another as for as long as I can remember. So what have you guys learned about the role of technology in enabling some of these major business transitions? And how are you applying those lessons now? I think to start, it's important to point out that 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 technology is not just an enabler. A lot of times, it's also the driver. Uh, you know, just look how digital has transformed media and entertainment consumption. And Moin touched on, on, on this previously. Technology as an enabler is seeing a shift towards a service-based model. Building infrastructure and capability is expensive and time-consuming, where we all need to be nimble and agile when reacting to transition. So you wanna structure your technology solutions away from bespoke architectures and solutions and towards reusable and extensible patterns and frameworks. That way, as there is a transition, you're able to respond very quickly to the needs of the business and and supporting it through the transition. I think Vlad's point on patterns is key. You know, that's something we, we're constantly striving for here. But I think the other piece I want to add as well is context. You know, context is something that's been key. And suffice it to say, it's, it's where we need to always align ourselves when it comes to the concepts of technology, data, and engineering. These are not independent tracks or disciplines, but they're really related and they should be aligned. And what I've seen work for myself in the past is, to, to take a look at technology within an enterprise and put it into two buckets, undifferentiated and differentiated. And to me, undifferentiated are technologies and platforms that are not necessarily driving the business forward, rather they're providing foundational or commoditized capabilities. You know, think of CRM platforms, content asset management, even data warehouse technology to some extent. This isn't where we should be investing our engineering strength, Rather, it's where we should be partnering with the right partners, with the relevant partners. And when you choose the right partners, you also have to be aware that there's this term I use, you're essentially creating a a displacement effect. So if I bring in a particular CRM ecosystem, how am I displacing all the other technologies? And I need to do it in a way where I'm cognizant of that because I want to drive interoperability. I want to drive some level of symbiosis between platforms. Differentiated is really where we need to drive our investment. These are the technologies that are really going to help distinguish and drive our brands in in the marketplace or in the landscape. And the more we focus on that and really use that, to Vlad's point earlier about enablement and driver, that's where I've seen a lot of the value come from. Now, Ralph Munson is Warner Music's CIO. And I know that in the old days, CIOs were kind of like, they they did the bidding of the other leaders in the corporation, very often the CEO and things like that. But you, you just see a lot more dynamism, a lot more leadership and strategic leadership these days. So if you would, talk about him, uh, his style of leadership and what it's like working with him. 
Sure. So Ralph is really a very, the term you use, dynamic leader, is a really great fit in describing him. And for me personally, one of the strongest drivers in my consideration to join Warner Music Group was the ability to work with Ralph. He possesses a, a balance of technology and business, and he really understands how technology differentiates, how it enables, how it empowers. He comes from a technology background himself, which is not common for a lot of CIOs. Some of them are coming from, from, from different disciplines that are equally important, finance, operations, and so forth. But he comes from a core technology background. He, you may not be aware of this, but he actually built iHeartRadio. Oh, really? Yeah. And the nice thing about that is he knows the art of the possible, and that changes the conversation that you can have with him as his directs, but also the conversation that he can have with his peers. And to be able to talk with a leader who essentially gets it, knows what can and can't happen, but can also drive technology as a differentiator and strategic conversations he's having with senior leadership, with the C-suite, with our boards. I think that kind of connection and alignment has been really great working with him because there's a sense that there's empathy from his part in knowing what we're trying to do because he gets it. But ultimately, he can then take that and then drive that in a language that makes sense to the leadership of the company. Now, you guys have been there about a year, and the company engaged with Snowflake before that. But I think it'd be really helpful, Vlad, if you'd explain, you know, kind of what the initial engagement was like, and then how you two have come in and changed the data strategy. Oh, I'd love to talk about this. So my relationship with Snowflake goes back quite far to, uh, I believe, right before they were generally available, in that there was an, an, an individual within the organization that had previously worked with me and asked me to get on the phone with one of the product people and uh, kick some things around, see what I thought of the product, if I had any ideas for how they can make their product better. And this is a relationship that, you know, has continued to this day. It obviously eventually turned into more of um, a customer relationship, me being a customer of uh, Snowflake. But I think that the the deep engagement and experience that I have with Snowflake when I brought that into WMG. I, I, I like to think that what we did was expand our partnership with Snowflake and how we use Snowflake from being just another cloud database to driving the vast majority of our data strategy. Right. So Warner Music had a relationship with Snowflake and you personally had a relationship with a company that was kind of, that was really deep from the very early days. That was interesting. I, I didn't realize that. So how have, you know, talk a little bit more detail about how you're using these technologies differently now than what, when Warner Music first adopted Snowflake. Sure. So We've we've introduced this concept, uh, you know, and, and this is just branding of an enterprise data asset, and that that attribute of data allowed us to free it from the silo where it currently, uh, you know, resided. So any data asset which has value to more than just one area of the business or more than one application, we are centrally landing it into a a corporate level Snowflake account, and again the that's just a a designation. It it doesn't mean anything from a Snowflake perspective. But from there, from our corporate account, that data asset is published out into our private data exchange. Mm. And the data exchange enables other Snowflake accounts within our organization, be they associated with an application or maybe sometimes an entire area of the business, like a label, they can come into this data exchange and they can subscribe to this data asset. So it's a model of of land once and, and use many. And all of this is happening without any kind uh, of data data replication. So the latencies are as as short as we can possibly make them because we aren't uh, having to replicate data all over the place. So We've you also just have found one, basically one copy of everything. It, that's right. It's one copy used many times and it's landed only once. There were some data assets we found that a different area areas of the business were each capturing and ingesting those data assets as a bespoke solution. 
And that, of course, is a duplicative effort. Right, right. Now, you've got a strategy called Data Lab. So explain that. Sure. So coming back to our model of the data exchange, we have a class of users who are data scientists and very advanced data analysts. The type of, of workload that they introduce is more of a discovery model. So keeping in mind what I just said about our data exchange, we have a Snowflake account called Data Lab. And within this data lab account, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a laboratory. We have our data scientists and our, and our analysts are in this account, subscribing to all of our data assets, enterprise data assets. They're also bringing their own data, as, uh, data assets to data lab, and they're looking for value. Now, do you mean like third-party data that they're That's bringing right. in or, okay, all right. So th think of weather data. Do weather patterns have, have an impact on uh, listening behaviors? So as they are discovering and experimenting and finding value with both our current data assets as well as any new data assets coming in, they are re-engaging with us to turn, to turn their discoveries into production solutions that we can then publish out to the data exchange once again. So it's not just a model of, of publishing raw data. We're also publishing enrichments that we are, are developing in-house to those data assets. So any of the business units functions, they can look at those things, they can pick it up and essentially quote, buy it just like they could any other data that's within the enterprise. That's right. And as I was alluding to, it's a two-way relationship. Right. They're not only subscribing, but they have the capability to publish as well. That's really cool. Uh, Vlad, I'm going to ask you to continue with this. You're talking about really hot stuff you're doing right now. So what about the future? What are the major trends in the data cloud technology and also any kind of data management stuff that you're keeping an eye on over the next year? The name of the game is going to be the ability to scale quickly and cost effectively. And this is where I think Snowflake really adds value for us. I, I don't want to be in, in the infrastructure business. It's not core to our business. I, I think that the money is better spent on building product and building services and the monetization of those products and services rather than spending it on, on, on keeping infrastructure going. So solutions that are cloud native, that are serverless and that are service-based, I think are, are the future. And especially if you look at fixed infrastructure deployments, they can only handle X amount of data and scaling that infrastructure is usually time consuming and expensive. And you look at a cloud native approach that auto scales as you need it and does so most of the time with very little latency, I think that's the future. You mentioned serverless computing and I, I'm sure a lot of the technology people um, who are listening know exactly what that is, but there may be some people who don't get that. And I know that's a very, that's a really key concept these days. So could you explain that a little bit? Sure. And it does also overlap with a service-based model where you're partnering with somebody that is abstracting away from you the fact that there is hardware behind your processes. So in an ideal world, let's say you develop a program. Traditionally, you would take this program, you, you would put it on a server, and it would run on the server. In a, a serverless model, you are deploying your code, not on a server, but rather through a service where you may select, I, I need this much memory, I need this much disk space, I need this much CPU, okay, go run. And all of the things that you normally have to deal with when it comes to running infrastructure, such as patching, security, firewalls, that's all handled for you, or most of it is handled for you and, and abstracted away from you. And again, it's, a, it's about being able to, to, their, to, to direct your spending to the places where it adds the most value for your business. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I see the future. What a fascinating modern age we live in. Is this what the future holds? 
Now, Moyne, I want to turn to you again. So I'm going to ask you to put your visionary cap on for a minute. Please look out five years into the future or so. And how do you expect the data cloud and data analytics to affect businesses and society, not just the music business, but let's go broad on this and even to society. What do you expect to happen here? These are always the tough questions, right? Because uh, if I knew what I was going to say five years ago, compared to where we are today. Um, we won't check back on you we'll in check five back. years, so Excellent. You're, you're safe. Excellent. So I think just building on what sort of Vlad was saying, taking that a little further, I think one of the things we're seeing today and we'll hopefully see continue in the, in the coming years is this idea of exchanges that are built around data. You know, I mentioned before that the, the music is a global ecosystem. You've got labels, distributors, partners, and of course, creators and consumers. But as with, as, and as with most businesses, you're part of larger ecosystems. So there's a trajectory towards taking technology and data and scaling these relationships between partners, vendors, and ultimately creators and consumers. So, Making data independent, somewhat self-aware and interoperable is going to be a continuing shift that we see a focus on. Content itself, similarly, is becoming more and more multi-platform, much like audiences today are more and more comprised of digital natives. There are audiences that are also digitally ambidextrous, if you will. And so you have a fragmentation of consumption that's happening that warrants a lot greater capacity and capability to meet these audiences, not just everywhere, which is what we can do today with streaming, but also every when and somewhat every how, depending on how that consumption is going to happen. So to do this, we need to ultimately get to a point where the concept of a semantic exchange is possible without the need to always move data from point to point not having this sort of replication model, but rather discover and share data in, in an ephemeral sense and also support multiple dialects, not just SQL, but dialects that work for persons, for services, systems, sensors, even aut autonomous agents. Think of what's, what search has done for discovery over the past several years. That's where data signals need to get to in the coming years. And a lot of this has been enabled in the past, from us being able to transcend storage, we've been able to transcend compute. I think the next thing we're looking to transcend is the idea of network, to transcend latencies, to actually be able to say, I can get all this done in a spatially unrestricted context. I don't have to be adjacent. I can be wherever I am and interoperate between companies, between partners, and allow these data signals to really be independent, you know, not, not to sound too corny, but you know, I personally feel that what we call ETL today will mean something very different in the future. You know, today it's a term we use in data. It stands for extract, transform, and load. But where I see the promise of data cloud taking us is an ETL that really ends up standing for empower, transform, and liberate. And that's really the, the hope I have for the coming years. Yeah, that's really great. So I just want to clarify and make sure I understand. So you guys have a, a private data exchange now, but you envision the future really being participating in public, even kind of industry-wide data exchanges. Is, is that what you're talking about? Yes, I think that would yeah. be ideal because the exchange really acknowledges the importance of sharing data. It's happening anyway today. And in many ways, it's a, it's a burden on companies because if I need to share data with a distributor, I need to package it up. I need to ship it to them. They need to unpackage it and then consume it and use it. And this sort of repeat, rinse and repeat process creates all kinds of latencies and impediments. Right, right. We think exchanges are really going to facilitate that. And exchanges that are semantically focused, where it's about how the data is relevant and how it needs to be used, are going to be critical. I just wanted to add some things to that. Um, so I just want to make it clear, like right now, when we engage our data partners on either side, either a partner we want to get data from, or maybe a partner that we may want to send data to, we're always asking the question, are you on any kind of a data exchange? Because we're always looking to simplify our own internal pipelines so that we don't have to replicate data, not only internally, but externally as well. It's It costs money to develop these interfaces. It costs money ongoing to support these interfaces and it costs money to replicate data. So 
when it is avoidable, I, I think it's in everybody's best interest to avoid it. That's interesting. And Moyne, you said something else that really intrigued me. You said that in the future, data will be self-aware. And that is, that's pretty intriguing, but I don't really understand it. So what do you mean by that? Sure. So self-aware in a few ways. One is that today, data alone is not sufficient. You have to have metadata that goes with it. So you already have a payload of two different things. Self-aware or even consider self-describing is the idea that if I share a data signal with you, it is sufficient in the way or shape it is without me needing to send you additional details, whether it's metadata, whether it's additional context, and that it can serve on its own to interoperate with whatever systems or processes exist in your domain. That's something we don't have today. Data cannot exist on its own, right? Data is essentially a noun. It needs to be described and operated upon. But a future where data is the verb is where that self-awareness becomes something that's key. I'd love to get more specific on it. And if I knew what it's going to be five <laughs> years from now, we'd be having a different conversation. But I think that that's something that needs to transcend. Oh, that's interesting. You know what the direction needs to be, but you don't know yeah. where the blazes are going to be on the trees. That's, Not that's yet, fine. yeah. For your information, there's a lot more to ogres than people think. Really need to dig deep and get to know the real you. In the real up close and personal. We typically end on a kind of a fun note. And I understand that you both of you, you just share a love for cars. So if you could tell us about that, what, what kind of cars you love and to what extent do you take these things? I'll go first. So for me, I think not a day goes by that I don't find myself perusing car sites. I'm sure Ralph doesn't want to hear this, but we're on various car sites throughout the day sharing links with each other, but I've always been drawn to these machines and I have somewhat of an unhealthy an unhealthy passion for sobs specifically, the loss of which I, I still feel to this day. But I think what I've always liked about cars is this ju juxtaposition of journey and destination and that the car exemplifies. A automobiles like many like many things are a truly connected device. I'm not talking about mobile devices or Bluetooth. I'm talking about there's a particular solace for me when you're in the right car, it helps blur the distinction between journey and destination. And you're ho holistically aligned in that moment. It's meditative, it's restorative and all aspects with the car become a sort of a guided med uh, meditation for me. Oh, that's um, funny. You're you know, starting to sound like a Matthew uh, McConaughey uh, Lincoln commercial now. I, I would do it for <laughs> sobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and Vlad, how about you? What's your passion? I think that somewhere in another life, alternate universe, I was probably or am probably a car mechanic. Uh, I I tend to I I tend to gravitate. Uh, towards doing things w w w with my hands. Uh, I think it's, it goes w w with the nature of my career where what we create is completely digital and hit delete and it's gone versus things like working on cars. It's a physical, a tactile activity. And I really crave that experience. Not to mention that when I was a teenager, there was a a person I met with a uh, 1970 uh, Dodge Duster. Was it Dodge? No, Plymouth Duster, excuse me. Yeah. And, Dodge uh, Dart, Plymouth Duster. That's right. And I must have been, I think, 12 at the time, 13 at the time. And if I remember, it was a 360. And uh, I got to witness a real 70s muscle car burnout. And from that point, I was hooked. So much so that later on in my teens, I had uh, a 74 Dodge Charger SC that had a 440 transplanted from, I think, a Coronet that I enjoyed for uh, a couple of years before it was stolen and never to be found. And, and so that kind of continued. My my previous love was uh, a 2003 Acura CL Type S, which is not not a typical enthusiast car, but yeah. but nobody touched that car besides me for, how long did I own it, 12 years? 12 years, 12, 12 to 13 years. Th that car was mine. Only I touched it. It was very heavily modified and I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I actually ended up selling it to my neighbor because his son loved that car so much and wanted that car. And he's still driving it now. Kindred spirits, right? Yeah. 
That's cool. The, the the last thing I wanted to mention is when I think back on the music industry, I think late 1990s, early thousands, an industry very defensive on it, back on its heels. And now the way you've described Warner Music today and the kind of stuff you're doing, you guys have, sw- you, you've switched, uh, flipped the switch or flipped the script. That's what it is. Flip the script. And you're really innovating and taking the industry to new places and not retreating, but charging out there and transforming it. And I think that's really a fascinating thing. And it's just amazing to see how data helps with that journey. So thanks very much for talking to us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you. This episode is brought to you by Snowflake, the data cloud company. Inside the data cloud, organizations unite their siloed data, discover and securely share data, and execute diverse analytic workloads across multiple clouds. Learn more at snowflake.com slash podcast.